the epistle appointed to be read for this, the twelfth Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the second epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, such is the assurance I have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as, of, as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He also it is who has made us fit ministers of the new covenant, not a letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministration of death, which was engraved in letters upon stones, was inaugurated in such glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it, shall not the ministration of the Spirit be still more glorious? For if there is glory in the ministration that condemned much more does the ministration that justify abound in glory in the Holy Gospel. It is taken from St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer got up to test him, saying, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How dost thou read? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole strength, with thy whole mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered rightly, Do this, and thou shalt live. But he, wishing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in with robbers, who, after both stripping him and beating him, went their way, leaving him half dead. But as it happened, a certain priest was going down the same way, and when he saw him, he passed by. And likewise, a Levite also, when he saw, was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came upon him, and seeing him was moved to compassion. And he went up to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And setting him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more thou spendest, I, on my way back, will repay thee. Which of these three, in thy opinion, proved himself neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? And he said, He who took pity on him. And Jesus said to him, Go, and do thou also in like manner. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. <clears throat> My beloved people, I draw your attention today to the feast days that uh, we will be observing this week and to read them carefully and to try as best you can Perhaps in the privacy of your own homes, remember at least what feast days they are and who they were who died and suffered death on those particular days. I continue to remind you to be conscientious about reading with much care each week 
the wonderful discourses on prayer by Father Graff. Please do not fail to maintain these and keep them so that when the series is complete, they, you might be, uh, you might wish to bind them, put them together in some form of a book. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost, Amen. How dost thou read? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole strength, with thy whole mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. My beloved people, this is certainly in conjunction with the, again, discourses on prayer that we are going through at the present time. Have we ever given serious thought to who made us? How why and whatever, by what force, by what strength, by what power. How did I get here? That's for me. But each of you, how, where'd you come from? Where did you come from? What brought you here? Why? Are you here? Last Sunday we talked about St. Bernard who asked himself that question every day. Why did you come here, Bernard? My beloved people, we are not mindful of just exactly who we are. Perhaps I could say uh, in a better way of what we are. Are. For some strange and unaccountable reason, man has always concluded that, without asking himself the question, those questions, that he pretty much got here on his own. He made the decision from all eternity, from wherever or however, and that, uh, well, I will be, I think and I will be. There are those who have said just those words. I think, therefore, I am. This is sure and uh, 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 plain insanity. And in today's gospel, There are two very great lessons, of course, the one with the Samaritan. (coughs) Excuse me. We won't go into that one because that one's plain enough about charity. But we will go into that one is, how must I love God? And we're told how we're supposed to love God. What is left for us? What part is left that belongs to us? Now, I didn't manufacture this thought. I didn't put this thought into words. Nor did I write this thought down in today's book. I had nothing to do with it. How must I put all of this together? How must I love him? How much is left in it for me? How much is left in it for me? Nothing. And what part of nothing do we not 
understand. Nothing is in it for me. Except one. And that takes care of everything. And that is that I, by doing what I'm told to do in that regard, am going to receive the ultimate possible reward than which there is none other greater my salvation the problem is and has been I guess since the time again of that stupid apple the problem is that I somehow conclude that I am master of my own circumstances and that I am in control of all that is that pre presents itself to me my beloved people I'm in control of nothing The sun came up this morning. Did I put it up there? The moon will show up tonight. Is the moon waiting on me to go out there and hang it up tonight when it's time for it to come up? I control nothing. Therefore, what part do I understand of I uh, with my whole heart and soul and mind and body and whatever do I love God with all that I am with all of my being with my very breath must I love God now comes a question a big question and it affects everybody in one way or the other then what must I do because of that and we hear such a word used in most cases that we must supernaturalize what on earth do we mean by supernaturalize? What is this? Is it opposed to naturalize? Then what does naturalize mean? What am I obliged to do? Well, I tell God, I love him, etc., etc., and etc., yet when I go out there and I have lots of money oh I'm just loaded with money I got about various and sundry ways of course but I am loaded with money so I want to uh, I want to immortalize my name therefore I think I'm going to start building hospitals with my much money all over and my name of course is going to be on great big letters in the front and I'm going to build orphanages and I'm going to build playgrounds and I'm going to have my plaque put up every place I go and I am going to gain this and that and the other I will be immortalized oh yes as long as that rock that my name is carved into stands up I'll be immortal as soon as that rock collapses then my immortality is gone but uh, I'll worry about that tomorrow in the meantime I'll build another hospital because money is really coming into me from all directions that makes me a humanitarian and humanitarians are good people 
I hate to go back, but I can't avoid going back to that poor, unfortunate Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray. That poor man gets a beating every chance I get. What on earth, with all of his, I do this, and I do that, and I don't do the other, and I don't do this thing. With all of his do's and don'ts, what did the Pharisee do? As far as everything is concerned, he was taking up valuable space on this planet that could have been saved for somebody much more deserving. And I, if I go back to the Pharisee, I have to go back to the other, other poor man in the back who, who didn't present anything that he'd done. Now, let's, some of us are familiar with bookkeeping. The balance sheet. All that goes on the balance sheet are the only things that are counted, the only figures that are added. And the final line, the line entry on the balance sheet tells you where you stand. That's the sheet that I have to give when at the end of the fiscal period, we call it, my boss man that I work for is going to call me and has said, tell, tell me, show me the balance sheet. And I will show it to him. What goes in that balance sheet and that line and, and, and the final column? That which my boss has ordered me to do. What I, that is for him, what I have failed to do for him does not go in there. But what about the man who builds all the hospitals? All that poor, unfortunate wretch is doing is keeping a simple day book. That's all. And nothing that he has written in that day book, you simply don't transfer interest from a day book to the general ledger. I think. Therefore, Everything he has done remains in the day book. And at the end of the fiscal period, when he's called in to make his report, the poor man only has his day book to bring with him. And that just isn't enough. That's putting it in that kind of language. There is a line. It is drawn. There are two existences. One is natural. We'll put that on the bottom side. And the other is supernatural. All the entries that are put on the bottom side of my work, the good work, the hospitals and the asylums and etc. etc. and all other things. They get entered in there because this down here, if you will keep in mind, that line, all the lines below this middle line, uh, my name is on there. First line. My name. And therefore, at the end of the fiscal period, all the entries that are recorded below this line here 
belong to me. And at the end of the fiscal period, I draw out this page, day book, I call it, and I look at all of the wonderful things that I have done. I am truly a great and wonderful humanitarian. Nothing gets moved up from the bottom side and put up on the top side. Nothing can cross that line that has my name upon it. Nothing. That's serious. And on the top side, I put on there, dear Lord, or dear boss man, or whoever, whatever you want to call him, I've really done nothing worthwhile. I don't deserve to be called in as one of yours because I have done nothing. My balance, my balance sheet is empty. I want to put something on there, but I simply don't know how to do it. And so the sheet is full of nothing, it looks like. But in reality, it is full. The poor old man that stayed in the back of the church, he simply said, I've done nothing, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Now you say, well, how on earth, that seems quite a bit unfair. That look at all the work I've done, and I get no credit for it. How can that be? How can that be? I have worked. I've given away millions and millions of dollars for this cause and that cause and the other cause. Surely I should get some kind of credit for this. No, as long as my name is on the top side of that sheet because it belongs to me. I cannot transfer it. They will not honor my name at the bank. And you know, here it comes. The way of God is so simple that we, with all of our great intelligence and wisdom and ability and training and know-how and everything else that we have got, you see, I'm a very well-educated man, and I have, uh, I, I, I'm very wise, I'm very prudent, and I have got lots of experience, and I, I really know what to do. But there's one little simple thing that absolutely baffles me, and for that, I lose everything. My bank, I can say, simply safely say today, my bank went bankrupt in spite of all my savings that I put into it. All I've got to do to change that picture completely around and to give myself the benefit of everything that I am entitled to, plus, is so unbelievably simple what I must do. Simply take my name off of the day book and say, this is all for you. Everything I do is yours. It's all I have got to do. We call that supernaturalize. And take away the glory of the world. I want none. I'm not entitled to it. Because the world forgets who I am the minute they throw the first shovelful of dirt into my face. The world will forget me. 
The only thing that is important is what I have done for him who gave me purpose, who told me that everything and anything you do, all you are doing down there, and don't ever forget it, you're simply rearranging the pebbles of the earth. Those pebbles do not belong to you. You did not make those pebbles. I made those pebbles. They are mine. And all you can do is for the short breath of time that you are there is to fool around with those pebbles and rearrange them. That does not change who they belong to. They are not yours. They never have been yours. They're not yours now, and they never will be yours, nor your inheritance or your your descendants. They will further rearrange them, and they will fight over them as if life itself depended on the ownership of another pebble. Now, isn't that crazy? It's absolutely insane. Yet, for somehow or other, for me, it is of the essence that those around me know how many pebbles I've got in my bag, which I very carefully walk around with outside. And that I spend, again, tons of money protecting those pebbles to keep somebody else from taking them away from me. The whole thing is backwards. The whole thing is backwards and upside down. Yet, that's what governs our way of life. My beloved people, what must we do to save our immortal souls? must love God with everything, with our very breath even must love God does that take anything actually you know I can can have as many pebbles either way really if I simply have the right, right attitude of mind as to who those pebbles are and what jurisdiction I have over those pebbles. That's the whole thing. And it's my admission. They are yours. And whatever pebble I move, by whatever force, foresight, thought, energy, whatever else you can call it to mind, whatever, if I just move one pebble, is because you, O oh God, gave me the strength and the ability to pick it up. Without you, I couldn't have done even that. Now, my dear people, is that difficult to do? Is this asking for a pound of flesh? I don't think so. But there are those who would be willing to surrender two pounds of flesh rather than admit one time that it was not they. That did it all. That's all we're asked, precious people. That's all that's asked of us. And for that... The reward that we get, there is nothing that we know of that can become compared to this reward. Eye has not seen, nor has ear heard. What is waiting for him who loves God?
now. They have installed a new clock in the pulpit here. So the clock is about to go off if I don't shut up. So I have to obey this clock. And I think I can push the button of this newfangled machine which says...